We got it. We got what we need. See you guys. Bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Setting up meeting for Facebook Live. Welcome to Tales, Tunes, and Tom Fullery, starring Jerry Springer, along with Gene Galvin and me. I'm Megan Hills. We're recorded live in front of a brilliant studio audience at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. My daddy and here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jerry Springer. Thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you, having three people applaud, that just <laughs> knocks me out. Well, it's the quality, it Jerry, not the quantity. Yeah. <laughs> Post-COVID audiences sure do look a lot different, don't they, Jerry? <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, that's, oh, the well. voice, that's the voice of Casey Campbell, our music coordinator. We've uh, pressed him. We do this periodically to be not only our music coordinator, Casey lines up all these great guests. We get, we're head from all over the country. Uh, up and coming singer songwriters, but he is a singer songwriter himself. And we've asked him to, as, as he has done a number of times in the past to be on with us tonight. And uh, Megan will introduce Casey a little bit later on, but Jerry, it, we open our podcast always with, we call them internally Jerry's rant where Jerry analyzes something that's happening. And uh, I know, cause we talked earlier that Something happened in New York City. This is interesting, Jerry, because you being a, a guy that went to high school and was raised in New York City uh, and born in England. And uh, that relates because the City Council of New York, uh, and it was agreed with by the mayor, Mayor de Blasio, has, is taking down the statue, the commemorative statue to Thomas Jefferson one of the committee of five that wrote the Declaration of Independence. He actually was the main guy, Jerry, I'll probably get into all this. Yep. But Thomas Jefferson's statue is coming down. And Jerry, what's your take? And I know in your take, you're gonna explain why they wanna take it down. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, a key battle in today's culture wars is being played out in New York City City Council as its members voted this month to remove the statue of founding father Thomas Jefferson from their chambers where it had stood for over 100 years. All this initially became an issue a few years back when white supremacists held a rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, protesting the call to remove the statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee their hero. African Americans weren't their only target. Some were wearing shirts carrying signs chanting, Jews shall not replace us. Now, as if this horrific scene wasn't bad enough, not surprisingly, President Trump defended these white supremacists by stating they were fine people on both sides. Really? Of course, Trump's blatant racism is not a surprise. But then he suggested what actually has become the subject of the present debate, that tearing down statues of Confederate generals takes us down a slippery slope. Who's next, he said, Washington, Jefferson? And here we are facing that exact question. Shall we obliterate or rename all structures that bear their names? Well, of course not. There's an obvious difference between Confederate generals and our founding fathers, even understanding that they were all flawed characters. Tearing down statues of Confederate leaders and generals makes sense because the only reason they are remembered today is because they were part of and leaders of the attack and war on the United States of America. They were the clearest example of traitors to our country responsible for the death of hundreds of thousands of our citizens. Indeed, the most treasonous act that has ever been committed against our nation for the sole purpose of preserving the indefensible and inhumane institution of slavery. Of course, they shouldn't be honored. So some ask, well then, if slavery is the issue, Jefferson owned slaves as did Washington and Madison and most of our founding fathers, though it should be said, not John Adams. 
So why should, for example, Jefferson statue remain standing? Well, there's a significant difference. Yes, Jefferson owned slaves, many of them, I think some 600. And in fact, he had six children by one of them, that's Sally Hemings. But though that's a significant fact of his clearly flawed character, it's not what he's being remembered for. No, he's being remembered for authoring the founding document of our nation, including perhaps the most famous and significant sentence in the English language. We hold these truths to be, we, I'm sorry, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I know he wrote these words and yet he didn't live by them. And he can't use the excuse that most people in his surroundings, white men of financial substance, that they owned slaves because there were many who didn't. And the moral debate was highly visible at the time. And he could have chosen to go the other way. Though being from Virginia, he wouldn't have had much of a political career if he had. But regardless of what we rightly see as his moral failing, this document and the founding of our nation is no small achievement. And that, as with George Washington, is what these people are being recognized for. Unlike the Confederate generals, they didn't try and destroy America. They created it in full recognition that at our, both, at our birth, we weren't yet perfect which is why the opening line of our constitution is, quote, in order to form a more perfect union. So I don't believe there's a slippery slope from Robert E. Lee to Thomas Jefferson. Indeed, there's no slope at all. However, having said all this, I think it's perfectly legitimate for each generation to choose who and what it wants to recognize or honor. Black Lives Matter has certainly made me more sensitive to how other people can be touched or hurt by what we say and do based on their life experiences, even if I or we don't intend to cause harm. To the extent that the New York City Council is making the statement that we shall not honor anyone who in their own life consistently supported the institution of slavery, when he or she could have chosen a more moral road, well, that's not a bad lesson for our kids. Indeed, better they ask, why isn't there a statue for the man who authored the Declaration of Independence? And we then can say, because he owned slaves. That's a pretty powerful lesson for our kids in itself. Yeah, yeah Jerry, absolutely. that's... That's excellent. Uh, you know, this topic is, well, it, it's very substantive and it probably we're looking at the leading edge of this because once New York did what they did, it's probably going to get thrashed out other places. And, I, and when I knew that you were going to uh, do a rant on this and I didn't know which way you were going to go on, and as I understand you, you're saying we have to differentiate between the traitors who are uh, generals of the Confederacy because they were cessationists, they, yeah. they were traitors. And Jefferson, on the other hand, uh, thought up largely, uh, by the way, just finished John Meacham's book. And I know you read it a while ago, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Springer, by the way, for people who don't know, is extremely well read, particularly in history. I was joking with him the other day and said, dude, you could you could teach AP high school history as well as college courses, uh, particularly in this political leadership niche. It's true, Jerry, right? I mean, that that's the area you really love. So you jumped yeah. on the Meacham book called Thomas Jefferson Colon, The Art of Power. And it's a, a well researched. Yeah. It's a great book. Uh, and so you're saying that the Confederate generals are traitors. And right. uh, clearly, clearly, uh, Jefferson was quite the opposite. And it made me think, and in a second, Casey and Megan jump in on this as well, because we probably all have some thoughts on this. 
are there, this is where I got stuck this week, landed, I didn't get stuck, I landed here. Are there some behaviors that a leader can do that are what I would call deal breakers for commemoration? Deal breakers. And I'll give some examples that I began to kind of think through when I landed at that spot. And you, Jerry, said, yes, a traitor to America. That's a deal breaker. Yeah. And those statues got to come down, have every right to be taken down. And we can explain it to the school children that that is being taken down because they were traitors to our country. Jefferson, on the other hand, was a founder of our, he, what he did was magnificent. It wasn't just good, it was magnificent because he thought up all the elements and a lot of people thought, and they, they edited it according to Meacham, the, for example, the Declaration of Independence, and they added things as they went, but he was a master at the political process of leading people and not getting too far ahead. He was a master. Now, on the other hand, and we also know there'll be no statues for Adolf Hitler. I know Marge Schott. Oh, yeah. Remember Marge Schott? Said, oh, yeah. Hey, he did a lot of good things. It was just that one thing. Yeah, like yeah. killing oh, six God. million Jews. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, by the way. By picky, the way, picky, picky. <laughs> by the way, her name, Marge Schott, our, our listeners across the country may not know it as well as we do. We're local to Cincinnati. Her name came off of a building at the University of Cincinnati. It came off a building at St. Ursula High School. I think she was a graduate and donated a lot of money. So Adolf Hitler will not have a statue anywhere in the world because what he did was a deal breaker. So, yep. and by the way, if a Catholic priest abused children, they're not going to canonize him or put his name on a school. But we've or a already church. got statues all over the Vatican and all over the world of Catholic priests that have more than likely abused children. So, like, you all can't right. you can't write, wipe that all clean. All and right. kind of going back to what Jerry was talking about and what you had mentioned, Gene. Like, my problem with the whole with the whole pro with this is is yes, he helped write this incredible document, like Gene said. However, while he was writing this, he was owning slaves. So while this incredible, enlightened, all men created equal, except for the people that I have in my backyard that I am not treating as human. So to be able to completely block off that part of his identity and personality while he has influence over something like that, that is really for me the bigger problem. That while all of this wonderful preaching is going on, the life that's being lived at home, not unlike the Catholic priests, is not it's it's not equitable to the life that he's preaching for other people to live. So are you saying that for you, the owning of slaves while he wrote those words, the hypocrisy of that, it actually even is worse, Megan. He called Cherokee Indians. It was, uh, again, yep. this is from Regent's book, who rose up against uh, white people coming into their uh, area and grabbing land, claiming land to grow cotton. That was the beginning yeah. of the whole plantation process. And uh, to that, Thomas Jefferson said that he called them the Cherokee, very advanced uh, indigenous uh, nation, by the way, called them wretches mm -hmm. and said, I'm paraphrasing here, we need to go into their villages and take the killing to them. We need to get yep. them right where they are. He said words that led later to Andrew Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, initiating the Trail of Tears, which sent those people, and most of them died on the way, a huge portion to go to Oklahoma. So yeah. are, are you agreeing that there are some behaviors that are just deal breakers? That they, they are, just and it's, it's the intentions behind it too. It's not just the behaviors because behaviors you can look at and say, okay, maybe they didn't know. The fact that he was able to clearly, you know, write and talk about freedoms that people, people are, that are God-given freedoms to any human be being and can't look past his own nose to see what he's doing in his own life. I feel like that's such a double standard. And, and to, I don't know, to honor that for me is, is very disingenuous because if he's as enlightened as he seems to be in his writing, 
then there would be no question about how he treated the uh, Native Americans and how he treated um, slaves. So I, I, there's just, it's way too much two-faced in there for me. I don't know. Casey, what, yeah, yeah, what do you think, Casey? Yeah, go, Casey. Well, yeah, so um, that it's, it's a very loaded question, especially when you get, for me, especially when you get into, uh, you know, figures of prominent you know, American history for us being Americans. Um, no, very, very few people, should I say, uh, throughout American history could be looked at in modern eyes and be labeled as blameless or be labeled as someone who would meet our current ethical ideals of, of a person who should be, you know, revered. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Abraham Lincoln, you know, you, you mentioned Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, who is almost universally revered across the political spectrum for what he you know did throughout his political career was also a, a tyrant to the native american population and and uh was was ruthless as well um for me for me statues statues are not history it's not we we are not talking now about tearing down the Colossus of Rhodes or, you know, the first statue that was built when settlers hit the, you know, the shores of America. I mean, we're talking about things that were put in place as memorials. And so statues are a way of memorializing history, not necessarily giving context to history. And I think that's where with the, uh, with the talk of Civil War monuments that were all erected, obviously, after the Civil They're not erecting monuments of, stat of Robert E. Lee during the Civil War, so they all came afterward from people who wanted to memorialize what he meant to the culture that they are trying to uh, cement as something that was virtuous. And that that is where, to me, I think Jerry's point in his... Uh, monologue was exactly right on is that as each generation comes forward and as we add a new layer to our understanding of our history uh what the true history of america and the people who founded this country is and what it means to us looking back on it now and then moving forward i think Every generation is going to have these moments, especially as we grow toward a more progressive and a more inclusive society. I think it's harder and harder to give a reason why we sh for example, you know, just because it was 50 years after the Civil War that a lot of these monuments went up, we would n in no way think it would be OK to go erect a new statue of Robert E. Lee. Um, and so is it erasing history? I suppose some people I see, I don't agree with it, but I see how they could wrap their mind around an historical object being removed from the halls of the New York, you know, uh, state legislature building is an erasure of history, but we're not erasing Thomas Jefferson from the history books. No. What we are trying to do is contextualize him and give a more complex picture of who he was as an actual person and not this floral ideal of a man from an oil painting. We're, you know, we're trying to put his life into context in the sense of we know this about him now. This, these, are, these are undisputed facts that Sally Hemings was a, perhaps an unwanted you know, or an unwilling mistress of his, and he fathered an entire generation and multiple multiple multiples of mixed race people that he never even uh acknowledged and and for so long his family fought to actually acknowledge the fact that this was real that's that's the real history and i think moving forward it's something that people need to get comfortable with is being uncomfortable in recognizing our true history as americans and what this idolization of founding fathers and the people who, you know, were the, the birth of this country, what that really means. Because if you, if, you go ask a, if you go ask a Native American, if you go ask an indigenous person, none of these people have any right to be revered. They're, they would, right. it, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it is a complex issue. And 
sadly, that's one dealing with complex issues is something that we don't do very well right now because everything is A or B, Democrat or Republican, left or right. And an issue like this is so much more complicated because while some people could look at it saying, well, that's going too far. Thomas Jefferson is a founding father. Go go to a history museum. Go to, you know, Monticello. Go to uh, read your, you know, most trusted history books, and you can still get your history. That does not mean that we have to memorialize this person in the halls of our legislature simply because it's been there for 120 years now. Yeah, I... Oh, God, there are a million thoughts that come to mind in this. Um, the, there's the moral issue, which is clear cut. You know, I think the four of us would agree, and hopefully most Americans would agree, that morally there is no defense of slavery, period. Right. But, okay, so not but. That is the world these people were born into. Now the question is, how do you change that world? And one of the ways we change it is through politics. When we talk about Thomas Jefferson and what he wrote, he didn't just write a line which created a new country. He literally wrote a line that didn't exist on this planet. Every country in the world up to that time except if you go back, well, no, no, even Roman times, I'm sorry, every country that exists in the world had a form of government where a few people at the top had the power and they governed. It could have been a monarchy, it could have been a military dictator, uh, it could have been, well, later on it would be a communist, whatever, a fascist, but every country, even a benevolent uh, king and queen like England had has for the last 100 years, 200 years, you know, whatever it was, here was a brand new human concept. And the new human concept is what if we could create a society that will move against this form of tyranny? And... So the steps are one at a time, maybe the easy, let's face it, if Thomas Jefferson had come out against slavery, he never would have been elected to the state legislature in Virginia. We never would have heard of Thomas Jefferson or any of these guys. You know, maybe John Adams could have started a revolution on his own. I don't know. But so what they did in their time, they started to move it a little bit at a time. In fact, the whole concept, which Thomas Jefferson, by the way, was not involved, it was not one of the signers of the Constitution. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people are converging the two, but forgetting that for much of that time, he was in Europe as our ambassador in France. Uh, but we moved it from uh, this tyranny to we'll start with, OK, Men are the only one that are allowed to own property and vote. And that was true in every society, every country. But let's start out at least with that group and say they're all created equally. And we have slaves here. So we'll have at least initially some recognition. The only way we'll get the Southern states to adopt the Constitution was if we put in that clause about three fifths of a person. Otherwise, every Southern state would not have ratified our constitution and there'd be no United States of America. There may be two different countries. I understand it could have gone differently, but we have to put all that into context. So for example, if you applied the same lesson today, there is no politician you know, about, no politician alive that didn't go along with the fact that uh, certain things women couldn't do, that certain things gays couldn't get married, married. I mean, if you look at all the steps we've taken in the last 40, 50 years, you you know, when Barack Obama got elected, he couldn't talk about gay marriage. Now you can't get elected unless you support it. So 
all these major moral issues keep evolving over time. That is not to excuse their moral decision, but politically, there is a thought that if you are, if you have a bad situation, a bad moral situation, you chip away as much as you can because you're going to need those votes to get it through. So everything was bargained. Civil rights didn't happen overnight, for, even without the, um, the Civil War. To get the Civil Rights Act, to get the Voting Rights Act passed, all of these things, how long did it take before we let 18-year-olds vote? In other words, it takes you, you, you buy a little bit at a time. And that's the only reason I'm saying, even though I go along with the New York City City Council, because I believe this generation has a right to choose who it's going to honor. But I understand the logic mm -hmm. of saying, you know what, we're not going to get the whole loaf at once, yeah. particularly when you talk about these cultural uh, moral issues. Let me ask so you a we, question. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. You just made, in my opinion, a great defense of why we should never scrub Thomas Jefferson from our history book because he did all that and, and he did hard things and he did great things. He was a big idea guy. But if we keep this discussion narrow to the taking down of a commemorative statue, which is when you look into the history of that statue in New York City, or you can go to Rushmore and look at the history of that. The one in New York City was put up in like 1900 and something by a military guy who wanted to commemorate the fact that he was for the freedom of religion. He has religion at its base. That's the why that particular one got there. But if Thomas Jefferson, if you're going to put up a commemorative statue, because I am for having taken it down, and God forbid, I start to think, well, Dean, you know, should we be taking Jefferson Hall off of the University of Cincinnati? And they took Marshot's name off of the building. Should they take four? Because to me, as I was saying before, there are certain behaviors that are deal breakers. And to me, there's a moral, I'll call them an immoral equivalency between the Holocaust the, the most evil thing I can imagine w humans could do to other humans and slavery in its own way, in Gene Galvin's opinion, is an immoral equivalent. And I'll say the genocide of Native Americans. I'll just name those three. I could be wrong, but that's how it goes in my yeah. brain. OK. Thomas Jefferson could have, and this relates to what Megan was saying earlier, could have, and you referenced 600 slaves in Thomas Jefferson's lifetime. Didn't have all of them at the end because slaves live and die. Thomas Jefferson even said, uh, women slaves are more valuable. And this is Thomas Jefferson's words. Women's, I'm paraphrasing. Women slaves were more valuable because they would breed more slaves. Thomas Jefferson wrote an ad tracking down while my hero, John Rankin, Ripley, Ohio, whose life overlapped with Thomas Jefferson's, who was a preacher and a philosopher and a hero for at the same time period articulating, no, all men are created equal, red man, black man, white man, they all, and, and Thomas Jefferson, I'm now creating, Jerry, the bad list, because we have a huge long list, by the way, in my mind, much longer on the good yeah. side, on the bad side. Here's another one. There were three kinds of emancipation. Partial, where an owner would say, my slaves are free, don't mess with them. The second was John Rankin, same time period said, full emancipation. You're just like a white farmer, go wherever the hell you want. If you wanna go back to another country, get a job, raise some money and get a ticket and go back to another country or go to Haiti or wherever. Thomas Jefferson said in his own words, documented in history, the only kind of emancipation, which he says, I think is eventually going to come, is to put them on boats and send them back. He was for colonialization. It's documented. So when I look at all of that, and he died, for God's sake, freeing his family members. Casey, you just referred to that. 
the children birthed by a 14-year-old at first, maybe 15. She brought his young daughter over to France, where he was also an emissary on behalf of the New America. And she was 14 years old when she showed up. A lot of people, this is why this is good to dig into this on our podcast. A lot of people don't know this. Sally Hemings was the half-sister of yeah. Thomas Jefferson's deceased wife. His, Thomas Jefferson's wife's father was having sex with slaves. One of them bore Sally Hemings. And then Jefferson, when, she, when he died, she just up and left because Jefferson's daughter gave her, as they called it, her time, her freedom. She went to Ohio and never talked about Thomas Jefferson. She got married and just carried on a life as a white woman. He did all of that. He didn't free anybody at the end. Uh, by the way, at uh, Mount Vernon, uh, Washington did on his deathbed in his will, freed his slaves. Yeah. If he lived his whole damn life, like you put it, Megan, with people in the yard getting him stuff and doing whatever he said, I say to this podcast group, how in the MF hell do you put up a commemorative statue? How do you justify like that man was too intelligent to not to be able to see the difference? And I understand what you were saying, Jerry, about, you know, steps, but it, it, to commemorate it, to put it up years later, it, it, it just seems to fly in the face of, of, of everything that this generation is trying to do. And like, maybe this isn't the, the voice and the image that this generation wants. And I fully support and understand that because the, the level of hypocrisy is just outstanding. Well, I, I just, just to be clear, as I said at the end of my, my uh, not rant or whatever it is, uh, my I'm commentary, saying. yeah, um, I, you know, I would vote to do away with it. This generation mm-hmm. is every yeah. right. And yeah. I understand, I agree with everything that you are saying about how he lived his life. I get it. Uh, I'm trying to put into... And so there's no need for us to have a statue of Thomas Jefferson. I am just saying that what is being honored by initially him being put up there and us recognizing it is the idea, how often have we said America is the only nation to have been created by an idea? We Mm -hmm. take that for granted now. And now we're starting to move back in the other direction, sadly, and we're seeing where that's going. So Mm -hmm. it is not a small matter that what he publicly did, not how he lived his personal life and the hypocrisy, and I get it all, and and, and that is significant. But at the time the statue was being put up and all the, you know, until this became really public knowledge 20 years ago or whatever, when, you know, the Hemings family sued to to be recognized, et cetera. Uh, But prior to that time, the whole purpose of Thomas Jefferson was all men are created equal. That is not just a political speech. That is was such a revolutionary idea for the planet Earth that a few years later came the French Revolution. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, democracy became a, a form of government that other countries and other people who want to come over to America suddenly took pride in. And, oh, wow, why don't we try this? Yeah, why shouldn't we have ultimately have the vote and have the say who our leaders are? That is such an incredible mm-hmm. to be the first, in a sense, publicly the first human on earth to really push that other than religious figures i would say you know it can't just flippantly be said aha you were a hypocrite you were a sinner you did something horrible you didn't follow what you're in your own private life what you publicly would do whatever he did privately thank god publicly he introduced this concept which founded a nation and that's all I'm saying. I yeah. absolutely today we can say, 
Yeah. That was a horrible moral thing. It should have been said back then for whatever reason it wasn't. And no, of all the things we can honor, we're not going to honor Thomas Jefferson um, because of the, uh, the race issue. I think it is crazy to support now that we are made so, it, it's just so obvious that we have a white supremacist country in terms of uh, white institutions running everything. We all, we all get it. And we can't be honoring these things. So I'm fine. If I were in city council in New York, there's no question I would vote. I don't want it. I just didn't want the moment to pass as if discussing this with on Robert E. Lee is right. anywhere on the same level yep. of, of, of what Thomas Jefferson did. Because if we had not recognized Thomas Jefferson when he was a public figure, there would be, I think it's fair to argue, at least for the next hundred years, no United States of America. There was no force pushing it anywhere on the planet, except these few founding fathers that said, you know what, here's an idea. Let's create a country based on this idea. That is so huge. Hey, give that, me, and then let's go even beyond that. What he did, Again, this is on the positive side. He fought, did he not, Jerry, for pretty much his entire life to protect this Republican approach to government against the so-called Federalists and the people in our own, among our own founding fathers who he constantly thought were creeping back to a monarchy or some elitist uh, heredity version of government. So uh, not only did Thomas Jefferson think all that up that he fought to protect it the whole way. But let me ask you this. Let's say, let's make the big jump and go from, because you're saying, Jerry, you would vote. And I remember your first day on city council in Cincinnati, you advanced a motion to stop the war. The Cincinnati city council would oppose the war in Vietnam. So it went, you further. It went further. My idiocy went further. I, the motion <laughs> said, prohibiting any Cincinnati resident from serving in undeclared wars. And since Congress had not yeah. declared war on Vietnam, I believed it was unconstitutional. And I was hoping that that ordinance would then go ultimately before <laughs> the Supreme Court, more forcing more. Congress to have to vote on whether we're, we, you true. know, and every politician wanted to avoid having to vote on it. That was the purpose of it. Well, I you was had... roundly condemned. There, that is why there are no statues of me in Cincinnati <laughs> City Hall. <laughs> is that is a faded, yeah. There is nothing more than a faded black and white oh. picture in the mayor's office. Well, you, you had you had guts, but so let me ask you this. So let's <laughs> jump from let's jump from because you were saying. Yeah, you know, you've said a lot and really good stuff, a lot, lot of wisdom, a lot of depth. But you would, if you were sitting on the city council in New York, you would have said, hey, yeah, this generation is saying, and by the way, there are people who are coming into the New York City Hall, New York City, City Hall saying we have other people we'd rather put up statues for than that yeah. guy for, for yeah. all of, of the hypocrisy and all the stuff that we've all talked about. So what do you do if you go out to, let's say, Rushmore? Now, by the way, quick, very briefly, the history of Mount Rushmore was it was a project of an artist who has deep, now deceased, deep roots into the KKK. He was a Danish-American artist who started doing a lot of statues, became very famous, of Abraham Lincoln. And he was like a card care. This is, you can easily find this. So in spite of the fact that he was, let's say himself, like what I would say Jefferson was a white supremacist and a racist because of the way Jefferson lived his life. He is the living definition of a white supremacist and a racist. So that guy was too. So it has a kind of a shaky history and yet we see it and you and I saw it together and I've seen it three other times with family members and once on a trip west in my uh, sports car is that it's phenomenal, isn't Jerry? It is, it is, uh, yeah. it's stunning. It's stunning. It's so intimate. And I don't know, Casey and Megan, if you guys have seen it, but uh, it is stunning. 
stunningly, it's stunningly beautiful, and it's actually although it's on a big mountain, it's very intimate. But remember, so the got, Native the Native Americans are kind of upset with all that. Oh, they because, want it down. Well, it was yeah, because land. that was their was that their was land. their land. <laughs> And on the other side of the uh, mountain, as I remember, and you're more familiar about Native American history than I am, uh, yeah. but they wanted someone from their culture put it's up happening. on that it's mountain. Crazy so they, it, it, it's yeah, about yeah. half done, maybe a little more than half. I've seen it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy horse, and it's being done by another artist with absolutely no government funding. He doesn't want that. He wants to maintain total freedom, a lot of volunteers helping, and it's also magnificent and it's growing. And, and by the way, Rushmore took a while to do too. So there are people who are, <laughs> there is a force now building to say that Jefferson's image and Washington's up there too, is uh, that those should come down. And, and I know I am real nervous about this. Someone said, should Jefferson's you know, she should go in with dynamite or chisels and take down Jefferson off of that. And I today I would say Jesus, that's like a bridge too far. I don't and maybe you could I could be criticized and say, well, cut the bullshit. If you, you either do or you don't. If you want it down in New York, it comes down in South Dakota. So I end up here and I want I wonder what you thought of this, Jerry, and Casey and Megan as well. What if we put up in all these places? where let's just stay on Jefferson for a minute, keep it narrow, and put up a plaque, a permanent thing, that in case you, you properly use the word historical context, which is always lacking. And by the way, people go in droves to Mount Rushmore and they know nothing about Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. That's scary, but that's yeah. the truth. They don't know this stuff. We're, that's a good reason to be talking about it on a podcast. They don't, they haven't read any books about Jefferson, which gets, get into this. Yeah. And maybe there needs to be a plaque that says, this dude did these great things, but this guy also died not freeing his slaves. They had to escape or wait for Abraham Lincoln. And Jerry, you gave him so much credit, which he deserves, for being this brilliant politician. And yet he walked away. He kept saying uh, slavery is evil. And not only did he commit the sin in his own personal life, he didn't have the skill or the courage to say, I know it's tough to get these southern states to buy in, but Jerry, it was tough to pass the Civil Rights Act. It was tough to pass the New Deal. It was tough to get Social Security and the Affordable Care Act, those were all real hard. And I'm talking to you, Jerry, where you are a politically skilled mind, do the damn work and lead. What do you think? Well, that, that's a great point. I, I, the creation of the country though, it wasn't a matter of, do, of just doing the hard work. If he had never entered politics, in other words, he never would have gotten out of Virginia uh, at that time if, let's say, he, he came out against slavery. He just would have been dead politically. Maybe if you come out of Massachusetts, uh, you could have survived. The abolitionists would have supported you. But the, the point was the Constitution said, which he had not anything to do with, of the 13 uh, colonies, uh, you know, we, we needed nine nine to pass it. Well, the Southern colonies weren't gonna vote for it. It, it didn't have yeah. anything to do with work. We now know even when they fought the, the Civil War, they were not gonna vote to become a part of a country unless, uh, unless there was that provision, which even was a compromise of three fifths of a slave would be a person, which is the most immoral thing you could have. So we always admit and agree that our original sin was is slavery and what we did to the Native Americans. There's no question about that. But then you're left with the question, should we have had a country in the first place? And if the if reality is at the time that the only way you were going to have a country eventually is by taking this one step at a time. I mean, that's a political public fact. These statues of 
of, of Jefferson and George Washington, it had nothing to do with their private lives. It was yeah. at the time they wanted to honor the creation of our country. Uh, so I, as a council member, certainly would have voted now to take that statue out, period. First of all, every time we have a new president, he puts up new pictures behind him. Yeah. With Trump, we had Andrew Jackson. Yeah. And, 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 and now with uh, Joe Biden, we put up, uh, you know, Bobby Kennedy and, and, and Thomas, Jeff uh, not Thomas Jefferson, uh, my mind's blank. But anyway, you put up different pictures up there and we don't have a, a big issue about changing the pictures with a new president. A statue is heavier. <laughs> Admit it. So <laughs> what is the argument over? You can't move something that's too heavy. I, I don't think there's... I'm a hundred, hundred percent with you on we should not have that statue there now. The point I was just trying to make is we can't simply dismiss that. Phew, how stupid was honoring right. Thomas Jefferson? Mm -hmm. Because what he did was the most, as I said, it is the single most significant political line ever written, ever written. It yeah, is the first was, we're standing up against yeah. dictatorships, monarchies, all of that. And that is an incredible thing. And that's what they were trying to honor. But it's lost now because of his personal behavior. So good. No more, no statue of him in, in City Hall, which is great. And Megan, not even what, on the mountain. I don't care if they. Oh, you know, really? You, that would, uh, that's well, not for you a bridge Would, would our far? lives not go on anymore? I mean, well, seriously, no. would you, would anybody lose their job? Would they lose their religion? Would there, if you changed a sculpture in, in the side of a mountain? I mean, that's, it's just not that big a deal to me. I think it was beautiful to look at, but now that it's, you know, it's being made clear to me what they represented. Well, no, if it's going to anger people, you know, unless, here's where I draw the line. If they could put, a carve me into Mount Adams, Cincinnati. There you go. My now face. That would be, yes. That's where I draw the line. That's the you know, Put me into Mount Adams in Cincinnati, <laughs> then I'm okay with Jefferson. That was for and, uh, John Quincy Adams, by the way, but that's oh. all right. Hey, Me <laughs> Megan, <laughs> would you, uh, what, uh, are you organizing a crew with uh, chisels and ropes and rappelling to go take his face off Rushmore, or is that too much. No, my you. equipment is it's it's being used to carve Jerry's face in Mount Adams. In Mount Adams. <laughs> okay. That's right. I'm taking it away from John Adams. <laughs> and John Adams had no slaves. There you go. So I screwed no, that I, up. I, yeah. I feel the same. How way, about Jerry Mount does. Healthy? Like, I'm not very healthy. Yeah, there you go, Mount Healthy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Hey, uh, it, you you've already touched on this. Maybe we close out uh, on this. It, is it? You touched on the fact that there's only so much, and this is coming from a skilled politician yourself, and I mean that in all honesty, that there's only so much you can expect for a political leader, particularly, as you say, Jefferson was kind of new to the politics world, to accomplish or to pull off or to sway people or to change minds. I've always wondered why there wasn't somebody in that group who were who are considered the founding fathers, who might say this, look, we all know the truth. We've got 20% of our population here on this Eastern seaboard are black people that, yeah, we brought them on boats and we're, you know, we're, we've enslaved them and varying degrees of feelings about the moral morality of that. And we know, and, and Jefferson knew there were thousands, maybe millions. Fact is we're probably up to 4 million indigenous people spread across the continental United States. And he, remember, with Lewis and Clark expedition, the core discovery sought out to discover, like, what's out there? So why couldn't somebody at that table say, look, and isn't it interesting that in 2021, this is where we've landed? Have we not landed in 2021 where we want the deciders, the decision makers, to be representatives of Caucasian, uh, European immigrants, one block, frankly, very large, 
African slaves and descendants, a second block, and Native Americans, a third block. And they were killed off with blankets, with smallpox in them, with ruthless things. That's the genocide issue. So we now today celebrate it when we get representatives elected to the Senate, like Ben Nighthorse Campbell, and, and he was the second U.S. Senator of Native American heritage. And we just elected a couple more Native Americans of that U.S. House of Representatives. We celebrated that we now have at the decision-making table, people from those through, think of that as like a three-legged stool. Couldn't there have been somebody in the early days that said, we got it. Indigenous people here, we got us, and I know we got the money and the guns, and, and that's well, how we had we abolitionists. We did well, we but did, they didn't we have, did, and we did, yeah. And we did. The, but why could the, the reality was they they didn't they just, have anywhere near the boats, they wouldn't, they couldn't have. I mean, that's I think it was horrible, but yeah. they didn't have the boats. So the question then was, do we just give up on this idea of having a country? And you know, yeah, that, maybe, that's maybe, what maybe they were right. faced with. In other words, we, we can say that, that there should never have been a Thomas Jefferson or because they didn't do it, which I get they made a horrible moral decision. Uh, but then I don't know whether when America would have been founded, whether we would have had a country of a democracy. We would have gone back to still having a, uh, a, a white king. Um, you know, they didn't get... I don't know what would have changed. In other words, you think it was you think it was inevitable that America would be birthed in the blood of two minorities. It was just inevitable, and it was a uh, proper part of the evolution because we were. Well, I don't think I don't think it should have been handled back then. But you first start start with Columbus coming over here, and then for the next couple of hundred years, we obliterated Native Americans. Of course, it shouldn't have been done, but I can't tell you then what what would have been formed. Uh, but in other words, in other words, at the time of the uh, of the birth of a of our nation, let's use 1776 as a marker. It was too much, and this may be the answer, Gene. It was too much to ask of any one person to have had the vision or a block of people to have had the vision that where we would eventually fight to get is to have a country with a three-legged stool merged into one country and deciding affairs. Well, that, this is, that is an interesting over. point. This is an interesting point because who said we needed to have a country created back then? In other words, you could have just dealt with the issue of we're colonies, but in yeah. our colonies, we're not going to permit slavery. You could have done that, but then you wouldn't have had the creation of a, the whole Southern economy was dependent economically. Uh, you know, they, the reason they brought slaves over, it, it was cheap labor. Those people yeah. weren't thinking about anything else. Yeah. It's disgusting, exactly. but they weren't. Yeah, so, yeah, true. Yeah, so there could have been people living over here that didn't slaughter Indian, uh, Native Americans, excuse me, that didn't slaughter Native Americans. There could have been people living over here um, who uh, said, we're not, let's not have slaves. And you would have various communities where they didn't have slaves. But once you wanted to combine all the area into one nation, you had to have everyone buy in. And something. if the South wouldn't buy in, which we know they didn't, they fought and died. They didn't want to do it. Some so still don't. <laughs> yes. So therefore, what you know, I, I don't know what the answer would be. I, but I think the question today is, we're not going to honor that, mm -hmm. and it's perfectly fine to say we don't honor it on, on Mount Rushmore. We don't honor it in the I city hall, yeah. and just don't honor it anymore. And I think this generation has every right, just as their generation decided what they were going to do. Well, this generation is purer and more moral. Yeah. And this generation has said, no, this isn't what we're going to honor. We recognize that the founding of the country was based in that. But, and, you know, to some extent that was courageous 
certainly to create a country, but unfortunately the price they paid was as immoral as the thing they were fighting. Because if you think about it, the reason they were fighting to, to create a United States of America is because they didn't want to pay the taxes without representation. Yeah. So they made this moral compromise because they didn't want to pay the taxes. Yeah, that, that's the that's, truth. That's yeah. the truth. That's, you know, if, if they didn't drop the T in the, in, in the Boston Harbor. Yeah. You know, maybe we it's, wouldn't have had this country to begin with because it was all about taxes in the beginning. Yeah. And I, hey, good I mean, con- all right. Yeah. I think, well, oh, well, I was just going to say, I think, I mean, I think that really goes to a greater point of the ultimate reckoning that we have to do as Americans and specifically Caucasian generational white Americans is that this is who we not only were, but are. I mean, I think you, I mean, you, you asked a minute ago, Gene, you know, it was, it, is it too much to ask that there would have been this, this idea of a consensus early on? And I don't think it was too much to ask, but I just don't think it was feasible for what Jerry, for, for the reasons that Jerry just put yeah. out. It, it was, it was a, it was all about the money. It was all about mm-hmm. the money and their yeah. personal freedom. And so moral, uh, moral issues were put to the side for the benefit of what they saw as their well-being. And we still fight these issues now. I mean, you know, as Jerry mentioned, the concept of America, you know, it was, it was, it was uh, talked about as the great experiment. And we're still living this experiment now. Of can we can we take so many so true. different viewpoints and make them work together for the benefit of us all? Sometimes why we don't can. we deal? That's a great point. Why don't we deal with that issue in our next podcast? Perfect. Love it. Love it. That's, you know, a, great that's, a, that's a great intro to it, Casey. Okay, yeah. that's a great idea, Megan. Do you have any closing thoughts? And when you're done with those. Introduce Casey with some music because he's got a unique yeah. song. But Megan, what, what are your closing thoughts? It's been a great discussion. What do you think? Yeah, it has been. Um, I think overall, I, I mean, obvious, I, I agree with you guys. I think that, you know, everything has its time and its place. And in, in the statues specifically in those, those things have had their time and their place. And it's time to move on and put them in the context in which they, they should be. So that as we have these conversations with future generations, that the full conversation can be had and not just the, I, you know, ideal, I like, can't think of the word anyway, putting somebody up literally on a pedestal um, and not knowing the whole story behind it. So I think it's important that we have these conversations um, so that the full history can be looked at. And with that being said, Casey, our own Mr. Casey Campbell um, has created for us an original uh, piece of work for us tonight. Casey, tell us about it. I have. Um, so uh, when Gene approached us, you know, about the 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 uh, concept of this episode here and, and the discussion, it just really got me thinking about it. And being from the South, uh, I think very often of the of the canonizing of Confederate uh, monuments and history and just how sort of antithetical that is to the notion of true Americanism and true what I deem as true patriotism and, 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 and a, uh, a clear view of what history means and how to put history into context and everything we've been talking about in this discussion here. So I just I had it all on my mind, and so over the last week I decided to write a song kind of specifically about this conversation, and so this will be the world premiere of a brand-new song called uh, yes, Statues of Stone. So, um, yeah, that's, that's yeah, where... Good for you, and and, and I pre- and honestly, I truly appreciate you guys for kind of bringing this to me, and it, it got me into the creative spirit. It's something you know, even coming now a year and a half after the start of the pandemic, it's something I've still sort of struggled with, and so having something on the forefront of my mind led me to want to write some poetry about it and put it to music. And so I thank you all for good. You owe us money. Send us a check. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Checks in the mail, Gene. Checks in the mail. <laughs> Dave, you getting that guitar okay? I just want to double check. Yep, sounds good, buddy. Excellent. All right. Well, here we go. Statues of Stone, everybody. All right. 
Our heroes are dead. They scream on the TV. And folks are accused of erasing history. While stories from the ages are whitewashed to guilt. And the truth is condemned as radical filth. But how can we call these men heroes? With unrighteous blood on their hands And statues of stone don't a history make No statues of stone don't a history make Good book does tell us beware of false idols and to think of the lesser while you sit in your saddles. But too often these cold granite ghosts of our greatness shine only through the beauty and the eyes of oppressors. So remember the tales of your heroes were penned from the back of a gun these statues of stone tell their own twisted truth these statues of stone tell their own twisted truth No man is born in front of another. No hero is without his sin. And no nation built upon stolen lands is recused of the innocent blood shed within. And to those who delay in its history, will be called to account one sweet day and them statues of stone they'll have nothing to say those statues of stone will have nothing to say and them statues of stone will have nothing to say nothing Hot damn. Oh, beautiful, man. Casey. All right, Thank ladies and gentlemen, much. again, that was one Mr. Casey Campbell. You oh. can find Casey on Spotify, on iTunes, anywhere you find him. You can find us, Tales, Tunes, and Tom Foolery. We ask you to give us both five star reviews so that we can continue bringing you great conversation and fantastic music. Thank you, Casey. Hey, right, my pleasure. That, Thank you all. That, That's why you we got, call you him. Have to, you have to do something with that it's yeah oh thank you jerry i appreciate that hey see we know a guy his name is jerry springer you may want to play it for him (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. call msnbc i'm serious you you just we'll talk about that yeah we ought to talk that they would play that you ought to just be a guest on one of their shows jerry do you know a guy hey jerry you you would think i would um i'll try to (laughs) Well, here's you know, I mean, I, Jerry, it's the, well, it's the I, yeah. it, oh, go ahead, Gene, go ahead. <laughs> well, here's how to, I think to make that happen. I, I think it's a great idea. And, and we can talk about this later, Jerry. You have the ability, I think, to get on to one of those shows of which there are many. And they, they you know, they, they need content. I don't think this is a heavy lift to find a spot to talk about how your national podcast dug into this topic and you bring with you in that conversation. Yeah. Casey Campbell. Yeah. In other words, it might be through a door that you open that he comes with you and say, our music yeah. coordinator then ended this episode with a song that he wrote the week before knowing we were going to discuss this. And it's really good. 
And I don't know whether they would use a clip of it or, but anyway, let's talk about that. I think there may be a way to, and I agree with you, Casey. I think that needs to be, we need to at least attempt to advance that. It's hard, isn't it, Casey, to get songs to break out? It's hard. Oh, it's, like, yeah, you yeah. always just have to try to get as many people to listen to it as you can. Yes. And hope that, hope that everyone does, you know, so. Oh, I, that, I agree. That, that is fantastic. You, you would, uh, if you make an appearance, you would have to mention that, uh, Jerry Springer got me this uh, <laughs> this gig. <laughs> this gig, you know. Try to. Hey, by the I'll way, you, uh, I'll do I've got some thing. pictures you could hold up of me. Just, his, there you go. He'll, he'll give you his headshot case. I'll just yeah. I'll put you, I'll put yeah. you on my shirt. I'll wear. I'll wear yes. it on my shirt. Yeah. There As a production note, I propose that next week we end with that song as well. And I think sure. when we do next yes. week. It may make sense. That's why we're doing it because it, it applies to both this episode and one that's uh, yeah that's coming. All right, Perfect. this one uh, or, or a let's say a future episode. So um, cool. on that, I think we're done. Uh, Megan, I may call you and David Proust and have you after I write something do an intro to the uh, the middle introduction to this double cut episode we just did we'll get all that figured out that's okay that's I, I just want to let the nation know i'm uh taking a pit stop i'll be right back no we're done <laughs> we're, oh yeah Good no night. come back jerry come back because we need you to record that second one yeah oh, oh, oh no i am just make jerry no, wait sit down i'm sit just down. taking a 30 second pit stop we don't you don't have to because david we don't I think he need... does have to gene <laughs> well he may but we don't need his commentary until next week. Until oh my God, Jerry, go potty. No, no, no Jerry. not Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> right, David Cruz? Uh, I don't well, think we need, we don't need to record that tonight. No, we can record it next week if he wants to. Well, or we what? could record it in uh, two weeks. Wait, from was now. this was this two shows? Oh, that's this is it's we've gone a full over we've gone an hour and eight minutes. So we're oh, we got two okay, shows. Well, why do, oh no, no, no. I can. I was teasing. I thought we were going to do. In I don't my think mind, we I was thinking we've got another forty-five minutes. I was going to go. No, I'll do the I'll do the other part, the other thing right now. All right, okay. okay let's go ahead and get it down. Are you ready to go? And you need to take yeah, a break. Yeah, because we're not going to be meeting next no, week. We're not. We're not. We're not. We're not. Right. We're so not. I, I better do it now. All right. So let me get intro. So hey, let's Jerry. open the show. Yeah, do an opening, and then we'll David, take it do you want more. us to do the opening, or do you want to put the opening in and post? Either way, it don't matter. It's thirty All seconds. Right, let's do the Let's, let's do the opening and uh, then I'll introduce you and I'll, and I'll do it. Yeah. The commentary. You got it. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to Tales, Tunes, and Tom Fullery, starring Jerry Springer, along with Gene Galvin and me, I'm Megan Hills. We're recorded live in front of a brilliant studio audience at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. My daddy and here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Springer. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, we've got... Uh, we did a couple episodes recently uh, where we really kind of dug into a topic. It was a very current topic, and you got to go back and listen to them. It had to do with New York City deciding to take down the statue of Thomas Jefferson. And of course, that's a big deal. A lot of implications on both sides of the political aisle. Is it cancel culture? Are you scrubbing history? Or are you holding accountable people who did some things that some might even argue were deal breaker behaviors? And uh, by the way, Casey Campbell is with us tonight. Casey. Hey, thanks, everybody. Woo! Woo! Music coordinator. He did an amazing song uh, for those episodes, and you'll, you'll hear those. But uh, Jerry, you have, and you did a commentary that sort of jump-started those previous conversations, uh, extended conversation that we cut into two episodes previously. And you have a, another commentary that is a kind of a, a sequel or it flows from the first yeah. one. And uh, we're anxious to hear it. What do you got? Okay. Well, in, as you said, in the last podcast, we talked about the latest example of we Americans trying to erase remnants of our racist past, uh, commonly referred to as our original sin, slavery. 
erasing the remnants by removing statue of those who either actively promoted the institution in their public lives or at least owned slaves in their private ones. Indeed, not a week goes by now without some story about the tearing down of statues of Robert E. Lee, for example, a traitor who led the Confederacy in its attack on America in the Civil War. But now the New York City Council was removing the statue of Thomas Jefferson, our founding father, the author of perhaps the world's most significant political document, the Declaration of Independence, declaring all men are created equal. The council removed his statue because he owned slaves and in fact fathered six children by one of them. But of course, this situation is different. He wasn't known for the circumstance of slavery. He was known for founding the modern world's most viable democracy. So removing his statue on moral grounds is at least debatable and arguably not warranted. But as for the likes of Robert E. Lee and what these Confederates visited upon America, these men should not, indeed must not be honored or celebrated. That seems obvious. But something else needs to be said before we start patting ourselves on the back for our moral purity here. And that is the Confederacy, which the likes of Lee stood for, is not dead. No, it's alive and well and kicking. It's just that nowadays, it's not a geographic entity. It's a cultural one. There's not a Mason Dixon line. There's a racial, religious, indeed a cultural one. And this perpetual civil war is once again heating up. But why are we surprised? It never really left us. It's in our DNA, racism that is. After all, we slaughtered Native Americans when we first came over, enslaved African Americans at our nation's birth, and shamefully carried out the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Along the way, we institutionalized our racism, reconstruction, the Jim Crow laws, lynchings, voter suppression, segregation. It never really went away. So each generation has been called upon to fight back against this ugliest instinct of our national character, from our victory in the Civil War of the 1860s to the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s, to electing President Obama, then to bounce back from the Trump presidency where he unleashed white supremacy by then we throwing him out in 2020. The point being that at some level, our nation's racism is always there a la Charlottesville in January 6th. Indeed, we're always confronted with the need to ward off these attacks on the better angels of our soul. And as we can see, our generation hasn't been spared the burden of this responsibility. Let it be clearly understood, tearing down Confederate statues is not enough. The Confederacy and the Civil War are not yet over where the battles were once fought on the fields of Gettysburg, Bull Run, and Appomattox, they are today being waged at local school board meetings by parents trying to prevent our children from being taught our racial history, waged at state capitals where legislators are passing laws to suppress African-American voting, waged on cable TV and social media where the likes of Fox News, Fox News pundits and Tucker Carlson are promoting his replacement theory that immigrants of people of color, immigration of people of color must be stopped, that these people are trying to replace us, us being white Christian Americans, that these people from what Trump has referred to, and forgive the language here, from shithole countries, these people in another decade or so will soon be in the majority. America demographically will no longer be white Christian. And according to Tucker, Democrats are pushing this because immigrants wanting to come to America are drawn by America's promise. And so therefore they naturally would vote Democrat, heaven forbid. So there you have it. The battle lines are drawn, not geographic, but cultural. The Confederacy lives forever threatening our nation. 
appealing sometimes violently to the darkest angels of our nature, seeking to destroy a multicultural democracy in the name of racial and religious purity. We must never think the battle is over. We must never get complacent. We must never stop fighting to protect the one statue that stands above all others, that lady in the harbor, the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your hungry, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. That's America at its best, a statue worth saving, the one statue that must never be torn down. Wow, yeah. excellent, Jerry. Absolutely. And a great yeah. follow-up to the episodes that preceded. Thanks for doing that. Unbelievable. All right. Excellent. All right. David, okay. I, I think we're done. David, you and I'll right. talk about how to organize the those two and, and where it, we'll get this figured out. But we got that second uh, uh, commentary in it. So we're good to go. Very All good. Right. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Perfect. Bye, guys. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank Bye -bye. you.